What's up YouTube? Welcome back to Gluten-Free Learning. Uh, today we are going to be looking at the standard beam element and the shape functions and um, then how those shape functions are used to derive the stiffness matrix. As part of the beam theory that we've uh, looked at before in a previous video, we are going to be looking at pure bending. So if we have a given beam, so we've got some beam, we've got our global coordinate system x and y, length l, and it's subject to pure bending, right? So if we recall, we're gonna get some V displacement, which is our transverse, and our phi, which is our change in transverse displacement per unit length, right? So that was looked at in my, uh, my beam theory video, so check that out, make sure you understand where that comes from. All right, so looking at our beam, we're gonna have two nodes, right? One node and two nodes. Because in finite element methods, we always deal with nodes. And this is a blown up picture. This is our node number one, node number two. So in reality, we're going to be looking at, you know, it's going to still look like a, your wire, sh wire shape. It's going to just say one and two. But for the purposes of understanding this, we're going to blow it up and make it actually look like a cross section beam of length L, nodes one and two. All right. so. Recall back from the beam video, the beam theory video, we know that there's going to be two degrees of freedom, right? We're going to have our V1 as well as our phi1, and we're going to have another transverse displacement, V2, phi2. So those are the change in transverse displacements per unit length, and those are applied at the nodes, all right? So before we were dealing with trusses and springs, our degrees of freedom were just displacements. There was for example, two degrees of freedom, they have four, or sorry, four, two nodes that have four degrees of freedom. There was a, an X component and a Y component for a truss. Now, because we're dealing with beam elements, we're looking at pure bending. So we're gonna have a degree of freedom related to the bending resistance at each of the nodes. And that's what the phi one and the phi two is for, right? So now we need to develop our, what's called shape functions. So the shape function basically are approximate, approximations, approximate polynomials of how our displacement and our displacement vectors are gonna uh, vary and change as we move along our beam. The number of shape functions equals the number of degrees of freedom in our system. And in this case, we got two nodes, we got four degrees of freedom, right? We got phi one, v1, phi two, and v2. So we're gonna have four shape functions for this particular system. And we assume that our shape function is gonna be V, right? Let's call it V, general displacement or general shape function. And we want it in the form of a polynomial because this is an approximation. This is approximate form of a polynomial because they're easy to deal with. And for small deformations, they're a pretty good approximation for the purposes of finite element methods. So why did I use C1, C2, C3, and C4? I used four constants because, because we have four degrees of freedom. So that's why you want to use four constants. That's where that came from. So we have a third order polynomial and that is going to be our assumed, our assumed displacement function. So this is a displacement function V along our beam. Right, so now let's just check out some boundary conditions. Because with this relationship, with this displacement function V, and also our, our phi equation, the change in displacement function with respect to X, with small changes in X, this says that with the applied boundary conditions, we can solve our displacement function in terms of our degrees of freedom. And those give us our, that will give us our shape function, right? Because the shape function just describes how our system or how our element is moving in terms of pure bending and transverse displacement because those are the two degrees of freedom and that's what the shape function describes how our element will behave under a certain condition. And again, watch the beam theory video to, to, to just get some background on uh, the differences between the beam element versus the truss and spring elements and again how the transverse displacement is related to our 
our phi, our change in transverse displacement per unit length. So watch the beam theory video. I'll have a link here, a bubble somewhere on the screen. So check it out and uh, make sure you understand where those came from. All right, so let's apply some boundary conditions and we're gonna look at node one. So node one, we have our x equals zero. So our v of zero equals, let's call it v1 equals c1. We'll call that equation one. And now we've got x equals l dv by dx. We could get c2. So if we take the derivative of our of our v, we got c2 plus 2c3x plus c3x squared. And remember that equals phi. So at x equals zero, phi of zero equals phi one. That equals c2. We will call that equation two. All right, so now we want to move to node number two. So now x is going to equal l. So we've got v of l equals v2. So v2 equals c1 plus c2l plus c3l squared plus c4l cubed. And yep, call that equation number three. And we've already taken the derivative, so let's do v prime of l equals phi two. That equals c2 plus 2c3. All right, so all I did, I plugged in L for our displacement function, and I took the derivative and I plugged in L for our the derivative of our displacement function over here, over here, and uh, then that's how we got our phi2. And this is going to be called equation four. There we go. So we've got four equations. And we've got four unknowns, C1, C2, C3, C4. So if we solve these simultaneously, now I'm not gonna do that because that will eat up all the time in the video, uh, but it is pretty simple. Um, you can check out my videos on numerical methods. If you are confused on how to solve those, we can use gauss seidel method or whatever. Um, I'll have a link here for checking out those videos and that will show you how to quickly uh, solve these simultaneous equations. But uh, I'm just gonna write out the solutions because I don't need to, this isn't a numerical methods video. So so if we simultaneously solve these equations, we get this system. All right, so this is the system that we get if we simultaneously solve the equations one, two, three, and four that I have up here. And we get C1 equals V1, C2 equals phi one, and C3 equals this monster, and C4 equals this monster. So now what we wanna do basically, we wanna take these functions, C1, C2, C3, and we want to substitute them back into our assumed displacement function. So if you recall that we had our displacement function, so if you recall that the displacement function was C1 plus C2x plus C3x squared plus C4x cubed. So now we've solved for C1, C2, C3, and C4. So we want to plug them all back in. We want to substitute C1, C2, C3, and C4 all into our displacement function because ultimately what we want to do, we're going to have, you know, just like our system of equations before and when we had a truss or a spring, we want to have some force vector equaling our stiffness matrix K times, you know, the displacement vector. So we need to find this displacement vector in order to solve for our, um, our stiffness matrix. So plugging these all back in, this will actually give us our shape function, right? So we wanna plug them back in and rearrange in terms of each degree of freedom, our V1, our phi1, our V2, and our phi2. So those are our degrees of freedom. So we need to rearrange them in terms of V1, phi1, V2, phi2, because that will give us our matrix form and then that we need to solve for the displacements v1 phi1 v2 and phi2 because those are displacements part of the displacement vector if you remember right so this will give us our shape function so by rearranging and plugging them in we get our displacement function the big one we're going to equal you know we're going to have something times v1 because we're rearranging in terms of our degrees of freedom v1 plus something else, phi one plus another beast, v two plus another guy at phi two because again, those are the degrees of freedom. 
and what we multiply them by, that is actually the shape functions. Call them n1, n2, n3, and n4. Right, so n1, n2, n3, and n4 are the shape functions. So remember I said earlier that the shape functions basically tell us how our beam element will react to certain displacements or certain deformations given a, a load condition, right? So the, the displacement function V is given in terms of a shape function multiplied by the degrees of freedom. And with the beam element, remember that we have two degrees of freedom per node. The beam theory video explains that we have a transverse displacement and then we have a change in the transverse displacement which is basically just the slope right take the derivative of anything you get the slope so that's our phi so those are the two degrees of freedom and now if you plug everything in when we do this rearranging right when we plug in our c1 c2 c3 we've already solved for our m1 n2 n3 and n4 um, i'm not going to do the derivation or do that entire um, exercise because basically it's just a lot of algebra so if you really want to do it you can go ahead but um, I doubt that you're gonna be required to do it on a test because it just basically tests your algebra skills and not actually concepts of finite element methods so I'm just gonna go ahead and write out um, our shape functions our n1 n2 n3 n4 and if you want you can do it on your own so these are our shape functions n1 n2 n3 and n4 uh, like I said before, you can go ahead and do them yourself if you want to practice your algebra or whatever, but um, you should be getting something like this, or well, you should you should get exactly this. And uh, so now given our shape functions, we just need to find our stiffness matrix, right? Now the stiffness matrix, it is found, it's using a strain equilibrium, which I will not do the derivation. Um, it's pretty complicated, and to be honest, I don't really fully understand it. So if you really want to see that derivation, just read your textbook. Um, you can pick through it step by step if you really want to, but at the end of the day, in this course, you just need to know how to use the stiffness matrix that you've derived. Um, I don't know what your class is, but in my classes, we're not going to be required to. Um, and in this course, it's a third year level finite element methods course, we just need to know how to, at the very minimum, I mean, you should be able to derive the shape functions, which you can do, which we've just done, which is pretty easy, and if you understand the shape functions and the degrees of freedom and how they relate to each other, then you should be fine for any problem that uh, is thrown at you in this course. So using these shape functions and the whole strain equilibrium, blah, 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 all that crap, you're basically going to come up with a stiffness matrix for the beam to look something like this. Yeah, so this is what the stiffness matrix for the beam looks like. Um, it's a four by four which makes sense, right, because we have two degrees of freedom per node, and if we're looking at one node or one element, one beam element, we're going to get a 4x4 four four stiffness matrix. And then, um, just like with the truss and spring system, when we're dealing with multiple nodes, or sorry, multiple elements, we're going to get a global stiffness matrix, and that's going to increase the overall uh, size of our stiffness matrix. But in this case, we just got two nodes, four degrees of freedom, we got a four by four system. And these correspond with our V1 slot, phi one, V2, phi two. And there we go. So you're gonna be given this usually on any test. Um, they'll probably give you this. I doubt they're gonna make you derive it or remember it. Um, but uh, yeah, if you really wanna see the derivation of this, it's just a bunch of matrix manipulation. So, I mean, if you can understand it, good on you. Um, it's pretty confusing, so I would just recommend understanding the shape functions and the degrees of freedom, how they relate to each other, and then just knowing that through strain equilibrium that we get our stiffness matrix K to look something like this. So this is the beam stiffness matrix, and we will do an example in my next video on how to apply this and solve for our degrees of freedom and our shape functions to get some numbers and see what they actually look like. So thanks for watching. If you like my videos, please subscribe to my channel. Um, I'm going to keep providing videos on numerical analysis as well as finite element methods. Uh, like my content, uh, like my videos, subscribe, share with your friends, and thanks for watching.